I'm now very glad that uh, our rest of our panelists for the next session have joined in. Uh, unfortunately, we wouldn't take questions for this panel. We will be taking all those and uh, emailing um, the answers back to all the viewers. I would now quickly like to thank everybody on the next panel who's joined up. And the last panel can now uh, uh, go and get yourself a nice drink. Thank you very much for your efforts. I will introduce the next panel. Um, we have got uh, Flavia Kumakama, from, who's the executive director of the Action Group for Human Rights, Health and Human Rights uh, HIV. Then we've got uh, Manan Shah, who's a vice president. Uh, Professor Manan Shah is the vice president of the Global Affairs team at Leo. Uh, he has been the assistant professor of public health um, pharmacy school of um, health of sciences in Dickinson, Farley Dickinson University. And also now a keen student in law. I think I really love that uh, when he said he's doing a very good law school to undertake this. And I think he's, he's really maturing well. Uh, and uh, Manan will uh, address the key issue of uh, where things are with skin and skin um, issues that uh, have these been neglected uh, or overshadowed by the four NCDs. My next speaker, who again, a very good uh, speaker for us and has really helped uh, patients uh, shape some of our agenda is Dr. Chandrasekhar Potke. He's a chief medical officer for the emerging markets of Vietris. Uh, uh, Dr. Chandrasekhar is now heading Vietris' um, huge portfolio in uh, emerging markets and has really helped us to shape uh, many of the agendas uh, that have been there. And uh, he has really helped uh, bring uh, the patients nearer to the health, uh, um, uh, to, to the pharmaceutical industry. And um, then we have got Christopher um, Agbe, who is the advocacy for Share Ghana. And uh, he's going to talk about autoimmune diseases. And lastly, we've got uh, Lefty from Mukwana from South Africa Depression Group. And I will ask now uh, Flavia to take over. I'll be shadowing her and uh, I'll be prompting people to keep things short. But lucky for us, we are going into, we have got that uh, um, buffer of our lunch break. We can cut into that. And uh, Professor Manan has uh, indicated he might have to leave us earlier. But thank you, Manan, please, uh, after you're presented, you, you'll be excused uh, from joining us and then. Thank you very much. Flavia, over to you now. Thank you very much, Kaldi, uh, for the introduction. And uh, I would like to welcome the panelists. Uh, but before we go into the presentations, I'd like us to understand that um, the impact of non-communicable diseases in Africa has become even worse now with uh, COVID-19. We do realize that patients with non-communicable diseases have shown uh, increasing mortality and morbidity because uh, we, we ca they cannot access the health centers because of the lockdowns and the, the fact that countries are putting a lot of emphasis on on COVID-19 and forgetting that there were diseases before even COVID-19 came down. Uh, we do realize that there is a lot of um, kind of shock as our systems are absorbing um, the, the patients of COVID, but at the same time, failing to meet the needs of other patients who have been pre-existing and who continue to exist, particularly um, the, the ones with non-communicable diseases. Um, we realize that also the, the, our social welfare during this period has been disrupted and our access to service, timely, safe and quality ongoing treatment has been disrupted. And uh, therefore, we shall continue to be uh, writing, uh, writing more mortality and morbidity. And you realize that also the vaccination programs have let down uh, the communities because um, we are looking to vaccinate the high-risk patients, but we haven't even 
had them get access to these um, vaccinations. Um, the COVID-19 uh, has caused further losses of jobs and uh, and a lot of psychological uh, challenges and mental health issues. And we see patients under severe pressure to access services. And of course, you realize that um, disease services for diseases like skin diseases, uh, nobody is even thinking that skin diseases exist. So we would like to, to know, to, to, to now discuss um, some of the key um, uh, key uh, dis discussions around uh, mental health and uh, some other some skin diseases and uh, I would like to therefore invite um, Professor Manasha to share with us the lessons learned from diabetes for tackling skin diseases and other NCDs. And we do have 10 minutes for you, Sha. Please uh, abide by the means because we have run out of time already and would like as much as possible to ensure that we have some questions after the sessions. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Flavia, and thank you. Hello, um, is Sha on? Yes, can you hear me? Hello? Yeah, Manan, carry on. Okay, great. Thank you, Goldie, for the invitation uh, to present. It's an honor to be here. I'm in um, Washington, D.C. this morning, and so apologies, I will need to leave before the end of the session um, to take the train back home. But I'm here to talk about the lessons learned from my time working in the diabetes space. Um, I was with Novo Nordisk for nearly a decade. Five of those years were spent working with the Changing Diabetes in Children program. And so when we look at the question that is a prompt for this session, I would take it not as a binary question of yes or no, but more there are lessons learned from work that's been done in the big four NCDs that can apply to other skin diseases um, and other, excuse me, other NCDs, including skin diseases. So if we go to the next slide, What I want to focus on is briefly about the company that I work for and its focus on skin diseases, uh, this Changing Diabetes in Children uh, program that I mentioned that I worked with previously, skin diseases at a glance, especially in Africa, and lessons learned for all NCDs uh, to apply moving forward. And I appreciate being uh, the first speaker in this session because there's a connection with skin diseases um, and what the other speakers will be talking about, especially from a mental health and wellness component. So if we go to the next slide. Leo Pharma is a healthcare company headquartered in Denmark. Uh, it was established in 1908, so it is over 110 years old. Um, over 6,000 people across the globe, uh, serving 92 million patients in 130 countries, uh, including many countries in Africa. Go to the next slide. There are over 3,000 identified skin diseases. So just putting that in perspective, we touch only a few of them, but the ones we do are some of the most common and prevalent ones out there, including psoriasis, eczema, um, acne, rosacea, actin keratosis, um, and then also uh, cancer-related uh, thrombosis as well. If we go to the next slide, we have a focus on helping people achieve healthy skin. Uh, it is the, the, the mission and the vision of what we do. Uh, it's helping those with skin diseases who are often overlooked. And especially when you compare to other NCDs, skin diseases or medical dermatology is very unknown. Um, there's a lot of confusion. There's a lot of assumptions of, oh, it's just a, a, an itch or a scratch or dry skin, put some lotion on it. But the connections with uh, comorbidities such as health, uh, mental health um, and even other uh, chronic diseases is, is often understated. Um, so I'm looking forward to shedding a bit of light on that. If we go to the next slide, 
As I mentioned, I previously worked at Novo Nordisk and one of the programs I was a, I had an honor to work with was something called Changing Diabetes in Children, which was launched in 2009 by Novo Nordisk, Roche, uh, ISPAT, and the World Diabetes Foundation. And it was prompted with our then CEO of Novo Nordisk going to Africa and understanding this sobering statistic that a child diagnosed with type 1 diabetes in Africa at the time had less than a year um, life expectancy rate. Um, and that was just something that was unacceptable. Um, since 2009, uh, CDIC has been active in 14 countries, including 10 in Africa, uh, and has changed the lives of over 29,000 children, including nearly 19,000 in Africa alone. The goal is to reach 100,000 children, uh, excuse me, that should be by 2030. Uh, and you can see here the list of the countries in Africa um, that this program is active in. Next slide. What makes, what makes CDIC successful, and again, what we can take away for other NCDs is first of all, the idea of a partnership to strengthen healthcare systems. In all 10 of the countries where CDIC is active in Africa, there's engagements with local ministries, patient associations, medical societies, uh, over 10 program partners. Memorandums of understanding have been signed with governments to help ensure coordination and sustainability. And this is not just a matter of handing uh, insulin vials to children and saying, okay, here you go. Um, there's a realization that like with all NCDs, there has to be more done. It has to go beyond the medicine. Um, so this includes investments in patient education and advocacy, training of healthcare professionals, over um, 10,000 ACPs have been trained, um, over 20 clinics have been built or refurbished, uh, and investments in medical supplies and cold chains as well. So this really is a holistic view at treating an NCD and going beyond, again, just the, the medication uh, that would be needed for, for, for saving lives. If we go to the next slide, let's switch gears to talk about skin diseases now and the lessons learned. Um, because with skin diseases, they can become a way to leverage the treatment of all NCDs. Uh, but first, let me just give you a quick overview of some of the characteristics of skin diseases in general. The sheer numbers, the prevalence of these diseases emphasize the importance. Skin diseases are the fourth most common cause of all human diseases. They impact nearly one out of every three people across the globe. And yet the burdens, burden is often underestimated despite their visibility. In Africa, fungal infections are the most common uh, type of skin diseases. And there is a connection with skin disease and other comorbidities, as mentioned, including mental health. For example, psoriasis has common comorbidities like obesity, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, uh, and several cancer types and depression as well. The burden of skin diseases includes their high prevalence and the associated morbidity over time, including severe itching, for instance, in the case of atopic dermatitis, or even disfigurement, as in the case of leprosy. Chronic inflammatory skin diseases includes their high prevalence, uh, excuse me, uh, chronic inflammatory skin diseases, for example, psoriasis are common, and the high prevalence of skin cancer and associated treatment costs can be an economic threat to some healthcare systems. This is likely to worsen as the average life expectancy of the world's population, including Africa, increases. A third important characteristic is about access to proper treatment and care. Despite the overwhelming prevalence of skin disease in primary care patients, studies from several places around the globe show that primary care providers are often ill-equipped to diagnose or manage a common dermatological disease. The Saudi Arabia-based evaluation from 2017, for example, revealed that more than two thirds of primary healthcare physicians demonstrated insufficient knowledge regarding common dermatological conditions. Other evidence within psoriasis suggests primary care providers are not sufficiently linking existing psoriasis diagnosis to new patient complaints of musculoskeletal pain, limiting early treatment uh, initiation. The healthcare worker shortages are another barrier. As WHO has documented, we have a shortfall of 18 million health workers uh, that must be filled in order to obtain true universal health care, health coverage commitments. For example, in Uganda, 10 dermatologists have to serve 35 million people. And in Ethiopia, there are 70 dermatologists for 100 million people. 
A combination of health, workforce shortages, and an insufficient knowledge, both in primary care and dermatology, can result in treatment delays. And once in treatment, the identification and management of common NCD more comorbidities is another major challenge so is being overlooked or ignored, whether it being in primary care or at the dermatologist level. For example, less than half of the primary care physicians and cardiologists are aware of increased cardiovascular comorbidities in people with psoriasis. If we go to the next slide, rather than seeing this as a competition, as mentioned, between the big four NCDs and others, I would argue that you can look at skin disease as an equally important member of the NCD family, um, which is worsening as a global problem. And even pre-COVID represented a significant percentage of all deaths globally. I'd argue that you can consider skin as a gateway to health overall. We know that many of the common skin diseases are connected to the NCD, such as diabetes, cardiovascular diseases, and mental illness. And improving skin disease care may therefore have benefits for the early detection and management of other NCDs too. With primary care being foundational to all health systems, an integrated and people-centered primary health service has the ability to leverage a multidisciplinary and dispersed care team effort to meet community needs. Skin disease is at the same time a relevant candidate to spearhead better treatment and care for NCDs and mental diseases. So the most common ones, like psoriasis as mentioned, are representative of NCDs and mental health issues in general, in the sense that they require long-term care, access and adherence to treatment, psychosocial support, and coordination across multidisciplinary care providers. Further, people living, for instance, with psoriasis are at a higher risk of having comorbidities and the impact is well-documented. A well-functioning primary care coordinated approach to the management of skin diseases, like other NCDs, could then serve as an instructive benchmark and point of reference in the development of care models for managing NCDs overall. As long as that care is led by specialists regarding treatment, approaches with the primary care sector having the role of ensuring adequate consideration and management of comorbidities. NCDs are a massive global health crisis, but by focusing on primary care level, we can prepare ourselves to be less vulnerable in new pandemic and by using skin diseases as a highly relevant prototype, we can develop better treatment and care for all NCDs. If we go to the next slide and in conclusion, what I want to share is, again, just the lessons learned. NCDs are too big to tackle solo. Coming from um, the pharmaceutical industry, we are quick to recognize that as much as, um, you know, we would like to say that we alone can do it, we realize that's just not possible. There has to be the coordination with governments, with medical experts, with the patient community. Everyone has to come together with their specific expertise, which leads to the second point. You need to understand who is an expert and who can bring insights and ex expertise into tackling any NCD and identify what that individual or entity can contribute. One of the other takeaways from CDIC is listening to those on the ground. The people who are there working at the clinics or treating the individual patients, they've seen and heard it all. It makes no sense and often is a waste of time and resources to assume that they don't know what they're talking about or don't have insights that could help in tackling NCDs. So listen to them. And lastly, it's worth knowing what is your transition plan? What, how do you plan to get in support efforts on the ground, whether at a country level or a regional level or across the entire continent? And how do you plan to ensure that's sustainable? And how do you plan to transition out or hand it over to a local entity? What is a long-term plan? It's very easy to go in and be very excited to make a difference, change NCDs, but there has to be that sustainability component to it as well. So thank you all for your time. Um, I hope you found this to be valuable. I'll turn it back to Flavia and look forward to hearing from the other panelists in this session. Thank you so much. Well, thank you very much for the presentation and uh, starting with your last statement that we need to be to ensure sustainability. Nations have to now to invest into um, looking at diseases as core. So the comorbidities need to be managed as comorbidities and you raise crit critical issues, so especially diabetes causing skin infection, but also because it is chronic. It, it increases and furthers the mental ill health of persons who are suffering from diabetes. 
Thank you very much and uh, for sharing with us with that, uh, that with us. And so we we'll go to our next presenter, um, Christopher Agbega. I beg your pardon about the, the pronunciation. I think Agbega or Agbega. Um, uh, please bear with me. Um, to be sharing with us the case of autoimmune and neurological conditions. Please, um, Christopher, take on the podium and kindly share with us your presentation. Ten minutes. Um, can you see me now? Yeah, yes. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, good afternoon. Um, my sincere apologies on the um, technicalities. My name is Lefate. I'm with the South African Depression and Anxiety Group. We are an NGO uh, based in South Africa, but also doing um, assisting in, in, in other countries, uh, near uh, neighboring countries, and the so to Switzerland um, and Botswana. But um, I would like to um, really uh, uh, if we can go to the next slide, please. Um, as the South African Depression and Anxiety Group, what we do is um, knowing that there are limitations with regard to access to mental health. Um, we've managed to focus on, on telephone counseling so that then we can make sure that the services are available to the patients. And uh, to, to date, we have uh, about 25 lines and also a 24 hour line helpline. And during the pandemic period, we've seen a rise in the cost of people um, seeking help. Uh, I would say about 63% rise. And also um, there are, because you know that um, there will be also related mental health challenges. Um, we've seen also about 65, over 65,000 calls um, during this period. And um, what we are also doing is that um, we are doing a patient's rights uh, advocacy, um, also advocating with, with, with some history in terms of advocate, uh, advocacy for mental health act. And also um, lately we are dealing with a case called Life is a Demon where 144 uh, mental ill patients were actually um, died in the care of, uh, of the government. So that's one thing that we are taking government to task. And we are working in partnership with South African Human Rights Com Commission and also working in partnership with Section 27 to ensure that um, um, patients get um, the, 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 the the, their rights are actually protected. Um, with social media, we're, because of COVID, we're able now to get access or make sure that the mental health information is accessible to patients, um, over 27,000 patients um, um, for this period. And uh, we have also rural counseling um, uh, containers that were placed strategically in, in, in informal settlements um, where young people within those communities who cannot access um, mental health services are able to get there and, and get treatment and, and, and for counseling and also referral to other professionals. And one also innovative um, tool that we are using, we calling it speak, speaking book. Speaking book basically combines artwork it combines also um, or, or recorded audio, it uses battery and, and, and patients can easily um, get information uh, from, from such a, a book. It's 16 pages of, of health information. For instance, we know that we have low literacy in, in, in South Africa and in, in, in Africa, and, and therefore it assists um, in terms of, of, of patients and also assist uh, with home-based care workers. And then with media and press, um, we have uh, managed to create partnerships with media um, and to date we have uh, um, over 75 million uh, worth of uh, media uh, coverage uh, for free that uh, we, we have through partnerships we have, we have managed to, to, to gain that. Uh, please let's move to the next slide. And as you know that um, 
uh, one of the key challenges is funding priorities. Um, you find that, for example, with mental health, um, only about 3% of the total health budget is allocated to mental health. So it's not really uh, prioritized. And therefore you find that also um, it's difficult for patients to get access to mental health uh, treatment. Uh, some of them, um, you find that, for example, ultimately it leads to, uh, uh, to, to difficulty to access uh, such services. And we know that with the advent of uh, COVID-19, a lot of um, uh, clinics and hospitals are overcrowded, uh, and therefore, um, it's, and most of the patients are out of patient, um, out of hosp hospital patients, and therefore they need to access to the support, and that's why we're using um, telephone counselling to, to 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 ensure that we assist them uh, with that. So, and also we know that uh, with COVID nineteen, so the very people who are, um, are vulnerable are people with comorbidities, and also we know that. Uh, uh, with COVID-19, 93% um, of people who are dying are actually a um, lot of people who are also having all this N N NCDs. Uh, please, let's move on to the next one. And uh, what we really would like to strive towards as the South African Depression and Anxiety Group is to ensure that at the end of the day, um, all these other government departments also in their policies, they also reflect health aspect in, in them. So that then it's not a priority of, um, of, uh, of, of Department of Health. It's not also, we're not operating in silos. Um, and also when decisions are made, um, the, the respect of patients are uh, also protected. Um, uh, so, so which is also one thing that we can show that this is not uh, only a vertical, but also horizontal uh, approaches are also implemented to ensure that at the end of the day, um, priorities of, 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 of patients are taken uh, into account. And, and then we also support the, Af um, the Africa CDC uh, aim of, of strengthening health systems. We believe that um, that will also strengthen our, our local community, especially at grassroots level, because you find that at grassroots level, at the street level, at the block level, at the village level, people are not able to link up with national priorities, national development uh, plans. Um, and, and you find that patients are, 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 are not properly organized there. So we believe that um, it's, it's up to nation states and also at, at, at government level to strengthen those um, those, those, those health systems. And um, we, we've, we've really managed to, I think as South African Depression Anxiety Group, um, we, we have some lessons that we could also share in terms of corporate uh, uh, partnerships that, that we're able to, to secure. For example, we with media, we were able, for example, to create, to, to partner um, uh, and, and create fellowships for, for journalists and who will focus on mental health. And that also, it's, 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 been, it's been helpful um, in that um, um, we are able then to get free media in, 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 in radio stations, in television, in print, in other social media platforms. And also we're able then to also partner with, um, with, with, with corporate South Africa, um, so that then uh, some of the areas where we cannot reach, some of the patients that we cannot reach, but through this funding, um, it, it's able to supplement the limitations of, of government. And, and with community, like I said, that um, it's, it's really, really important to ensure that um, we, we strengthen the systems at, at grassroots level, especially at, at, at community level, to ensure that uh, people, uh, patients access um, this, uh, this, these services. And, and in, in fact, today and yesterday, we, we are currently busy with the life is um process. We are taking uh, the Gauteng um, um, Department of, of Health uh, to task so because um, for, for those 144 people, uh, patients who died, in the care of government, uh, we want to ensure that um, there's accountability and then those um, lives uh, are not, um, uh, uh, but some people are actually held to account. Next uh, slide, please. Um, ladies and gentlemen, uh, as a South African Depression and Anxiety Group, we are also, um, uh, uh, we can be contacted on even on social platforms. Um, but um, I think if you would really like to engage us more, uh, please um, get our details so then we can see how we could be of help and add value to your work in, in your various communities. I uh, thank you. Thank you very much for presenting Lefate.
Uh, you raise uh, very critical um, issues, particularly around involvement of communities in service delivery. And you are doing great work. In fact, you, you, are, you, are, you are the catchword now because with COVID-19, the lockdowns, mental health and depression will be the commonest disease in whole health centers in the few, a few years to come. You also raised the issue around health financing. And I think we need to up our advocacy and ensure that our governments are actually uh, ensuring that the 15% declared uh, percent of the budget declared in Abuja in 2015 needs to be, uh, we need to hold our governments accountable to that commitment. Because 2015 was the, was the year when they were supposed to have done that. And we realized that for me in Uganda, we are now at 6.3. The highest we have been was 8.9, but has still, again, drastically reduced. So with COVID-19 and the resultant Ill illnesses like mental health, I think we need to up our advocacy to ensure that there is increasing health financing in our countries and ensure that we have universal health coverage for, for, for our communities and our countries. Uh, the other uh, issue you raise um, is around advoc media, media engagement. I think the media has a lot to do, including the TVs, the social media, the, the phones, people have phones and they are using them for all kinds of information. So we need to find a means of targeting uh, that. So thank you very much, Rafati. And I would like now to get back to um, Christopher. I hope you are now on. Hopefully yes, your connection is better. It's thank better you. now, yes. Yes, please. Yes. Yes, Welcome please. back. Thank you so much once again. My name is Christopher Agaga. Um, I am an advocacy officer for Sheke Ghana. Currently, I am the project officer for the Ghana Federation of Disability Organizations, uh, working on COVID-19 and accessibility. So this particular presentation is so dear to my heart. And also, I'm an advocate and a peer trainer for the Ghana Non-Communicable Disease Alliance. So there's quite a lot I'm going to be sharing um, on the topic, have the big four NCDs, that is cancer, diabetes, COPD, have they overshadowed these other NCDs that are also very important and especially at these times of the COVID-19 where there are quite um, a lot of uh, challenges going on. So my presentation outline, um, I'm just going to run through it. Um, I'm just going to define what autoimmune and neurological conditions are. And then I'm going to give an account of what the situation was for persons with autoimmune and neurological conditions before COVID-19. And then the pandemic takes center stage. That will be my next presentation. And then where do we go from here? So autoimmune, an autoimmune disease is a disease in which the body's immune system attacks healthy cells. So I, I believe that you've heard of rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, um, inflammatory bowel disease, uh, multiple sclerosis. These are all autoimmune diseases. There are a lot of them. Um, and neurological conditions are disorders that affect the brain as well as the nerves found throughout the human body and the spinal cord. So you have conditions such as um, acute spinal cord injury, Alzheimer's disease. Um, you have um, brain tumor, cerebral aneurysm, epilepsy. There are quite a lot of them. Now, in Ghana, before COVID, the, the state in which persons with, living with these conditions were in before COVID was very dire. First of all, people don't even know to a large extent what these conditions are and how they, aff they affect the individual. So it was a very huge thing for just somebody to even say, I have an autoimmune condition or I have a neurological condition especially those that don't appear physically, but then there's a lot going on. So one of the issues is that there weren't or aren't that many specialists for this type of disease conditions in Ghana. When Manan was sharing his presentation and talking about the disparity between dermatologists and the number of people they have to, that, that's the ratio actually gives. In Ghana, there are only two rheumato uh, uh, rheumatologists that serve the entire body of autoimmune and neurological conditions here in Ghana too. And they are all in the capital city and there are 16 regions. 
So let that sink in, the challenge of getting access to the, the specialist you need to actually help you even with your diagnosis before you move on to your medications. There's the universal health coverage in Ghana is very limited. It doesn't cover the needs of persons with autoimmune and neurological conditions. And the high levels of stigmatization and discrimination, like I said, you have a lot of people not even understanding what these conditions are. So when you go even to the hospitals for those who should know better, the, the kind of feedback that we, we kept on getting from them wasn't very helpful because you are here talking about a condition that is not really known to a lot of people. Now, when COVID came, when, when COVID took um, shape, one of the issues was that now, for a person with an autoimmune and neurological condition, you already have an underlying health condition. And then the announcement is made that you are more susceptible to the condition or to COVID-19 if it takes over. Immediately, there was a high level of anxiety, depression, and other mental conditions amongst this community, persons living with autoimmune conditions. It was so high that people started fleeing the capital city to go and live in the villages in the hopes that they will be far away from whatever disease condition this is. Unfortunately, also there, there was an upsurge of lifelong medications. Persons with autoimmune conditions take medications for the rest of their life. And one of them was hydroxychloroquine. If we do remember, um, last year, Donald Trump of the United States of America came out to say that hydroxychloroquine is the cure for, um, for COVID not knowing that hydroxychloroquine is actually a medication taken by persons with autoimmune condition. It is their lifelong medication. So when that announcement was made, there was hoarding of this medication that led to the surge in prices, which was very, very unfortunate. And of course, it is also not covered by the National Health Insurance Scheme. The inaccessible healthcare services and therapy was even at a larger scale. The increased cost of living as well was also a problem and um, a total negligence and ignorance on how to administer vaccinations. We are in the period of vaccinations, but even the health workers and the government is very ignorant as to how to even administer vaccines for persons living with autoimmune conditions. It is, it is very, very um, upsetting, very discouraging amongst the autoimmune con um, community. Where do we go from here? The availability and accessibility of innovative mental health services for persons with autoimmune and neurological conditions is very much needed. Mental health conditions are nothing to play with. And when I say innovative, this is like we're having an online meeting right now. This is the time where online counseling sessions and online mental health services would have to be provided for persons with such conditions so that we can reach a larger number, especially in this time where there is the um, no social distancing. You don't move around a lot. There are so many protocols that are laid down that is preventing that face-to-face -face physical uh, contact between a service provider and a, 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 a somebody who is in need of such services. The meaningful involvement of relevant CSOs, OPWDs, and non-communicable disease organizations in committee set up by the government for COVID-19 interventions, unfortunately, we have seen countless times without number of how the government keeps coming up with COVID-19 interventions, but these interventions are void of the needs of these NCDs because you don't find people representing them on these committees. So the government is doing what it thinks is helping the, the people, but we are not seeing the real impact because even on the committee that are set to bring out these interventions, you don't find people with autoimmune conditions who understand the issue on these committees. And of course, balancing the UHC, that's the universal health coverage, to support all NCDs. It is very, very important that that balance is made. You, let, me, let me even give this, this pictorial understanding. Look at a 100 meter race, for example, where everybody is racing to achieve healthcare or access healthcare the best of healthcare through universal health coverage. For persons with autoimmune conditions, you are starting behind the 200 meter line, racing with those on the 100 meter line. 
in the hopes that you are all going to arrive at the finish line at the same time. This is this is this is um, it, it, I don't even know the words to use, but it it even makes the situation even more dire. And that has been the situation for persons with autoimmune conditions throughout before COVID and then it escalated during COVID. And then this is what we have to be doing to ensure that persons with such conditions are well cared for. The, 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 this is a quote from Antonio Guterres, the UN um, uh, president. He said that the world has yet to fulfill its promise of implementing measures to reduce the risk of dying prematurely from NCDs. Political commitments have often not been translated into concrete actions. Um, he said this a couple of years ago, it is still relevant today. And, and until we see that political will, I don't think we, uh, we may be coming back next year or next two years, and I'll be saying the same thing over and over again, because for me personally, and for a person like me living with an, uh, a neurological condition, I don't think that, that COVID-19 is going anywhere anytime soon. Um, before, before I conclude, or as I conclude, um, just to also share with you that um, I'm, I represent an organization known as Sheke Ghana, which is a nonprofit organization set up in 2007 uh, for persons with autoimmune neurological conditions, um, including children and their caregivers. Um, on the screen is our contact details, uh, uh, where you can find us via websites, because there's a lot we are doing even in these times to ensure that children with neurological conditions are well catered for, are well taken care of. The fact that there is a pandemic doesn't mean we should neglect the children or we should neglect these very key people who are going through a lot within this time. You can also find us on social media. There are so many things that we are doing and our website as well. Um, I have shared a couple of pictures here with regards to some of the things we do. If you look at the picture below, that is the president of the country. And one of the things that we were able to do last year was that we were able to meet with him when, in one of the regions and share an NCD manifesto. That's how we called it, an NCD manifesto with the president of the country to understand that COVID-19 is actually affecting persons living with NCDs, especially autoimmune and neurological conditions. And it was very encouraging to see that right after this engagement, we saw the president in his address to the nation admit that indeed we need to look at the needs of persons living with NCDs. And thank you so much um, for, for this opportunity to speak. Thank you. Presentation and you raised the um, uh, issue of political will is very important in addressing the neglected communities, neglected uh, persons, but also the neglected diseases. And uh, of course, um, COVID-19 has shown, has shown us that our systems are so weak that we were never prepared for anything big. We thought it was business as usual. Even after the lockdown, for instance, in Uganda, you come to the second lockdown and realize there is no space in hospitals and they had a whole year with money to procure the equipment, to, to, to recruit personnel, you know, to buy the commodities. But a year later, we still have a lot of gaps which have, nobody has even attempted to, to fill. And so the political will and commitment is very important in addressing uh, this epidemic, particularly the, 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 the communities that are highly affected by other diseases and have been put uh, at more risk with lockdown. Thank you very much. And uh, we'll go to our next presenter. We shall have our questions after. I believe people are already sharing their questions in the question, there's a question link which was shared in the emails we received. Uh, and so I'm hoping that those who have questions can send them to the link so that as soon as we finish the presentation, then um, the team can start now answering the questions uh, posed by the, the participants. So our last presentation is by Dr. Sheikh Kar, Pope Kar and uh, it's looking at uh, Beatrice's position on, on NCDs and emerging markets in low and middle income countries and how Beatrice's innovative biosimilar and generic business makes innovation accessible. Over to you, Dr. Shekhar. 
Thank you very much, uh, Flavia. And at the outset, uh, let me congratulate uh, Kavaljeet and the entire organizing committee to host the first African Patient Congress. After the last month's World Health Summit, uh, I think uh, this Congress really brings the focus back, a focus on Africa, which is where the spotlight should be, and um, on its healthcare system. I also want to uh, congratulate the organizing committee for a very thoughtful choice of the topic, the focus on other NCDs. I think this is so very important as we are uh, facing this pandemic and focus uh, on even big four NCDs, big five NCDs is also something that we are seeing dwindling. Okay, so uh, let me uh, start with a provocative statement. If, if, uh, if you look at if I'm a, a patient with living with NCDs in a low or low middle income country, like uh, any, any of the African countries or South Asian countries, I may be experiencing a triple whammy. Well, why, why do I say so? Because as a patient, I see the progress on the achievement on NCD goals, a sustainable development goal 3.4 is slow. Most of the countries in my region are not likely to achieve the target even by 2030. As uh, the previous speakers have talked about, the pandemic has created this complex interplay with NCDs, and uh, which is almost uh, like a syndemic. And we are seeing disruption of the NCD services. We are seeing the NCD risks, which are going up. And this is, uh, this is only going to get worse. And finally, and most importantly, for the purpose of this session, I think we our focus is somewhat narrow. We are really focusing on the big four or the big five NCDs and we, when we need to look at uh, things holistically. And this is exactly where uh, I believe the framework which is provided by the NCDI poverty, which is the Lancet Commission, I think that is something which is very, very useful. So why, why do I say so? If you look at the reasons uh, in terms of the scope of the NCDI, it covers the poorest billion, which is where 90% of the uh, population in Africa and uh, South, Asia, South Asia is really part of uh, uh, this segment. This is where one third of the NCD burden uh, is what we see today. And it is growing very rapidly, 67% growth overseen over the last couple of decades. And it is expected to be the leading cause of the disease burden in 2030. So the focus is uh, where NCDI should be. Uh, the NCDI framework also expands to cover not just NCD4, but it includes mental health, epilepsy, sickle cell disease, hemoglobinopathy, substance abuse, and injuries, which is what is affecting the poorest of the poor. And finally, we also see the NCDI framework looks at the demographics differently because 90% of the population in the poorest billion is less than 55 years old. The risk factors are different. We are talking about poverty. We are talking about social determinants of health, access to medicines. We're talking about climate. And these are over and above the conventional four big risk factors, tobacco, diet, exercise, alcohol. And we also need to focus on disability, not just deaths. So holistically, this framework is something which is very useful and it really will expand our uh, uh, solution uh, focus. So what does it mean from a solution perspective? This pandemic, if there is anything that we have learned very clearly, that the tools and the techniques which are useful for dealing with this pandemic are also the tools and techniques which are useful for the NCD control. Uh, let me explain. So, uh, so what, what is common in the countries which have fared well in terms of pandemic response or pandemic preparedness? These countries have had good investments in their healthcare systems. These countries have included uh, different stakeholders like governments, uh, private industry, communities. And these are the countries which have shown exceptional execution, quick uh, introduction of the medicines, vaccines, and uh, quick uh, action from screening, tra uh, uh, testing, tracking, and screening. So th this is where these countries differentiate themselves. These are the same themes which are also applicable for the NCDs. The language or the translation might be different, emphasis might be different. So for example, when we talk about investments, we are talking about investments in universal health care, but also for NCDs, we are also looking at uh, how do we strengthen the, uh, address the social determinants of health. That's an important factor when we are talking about the poorest bil uh, 1 billion uh, population. Uh, 
when we talk about inclusion we are talking about including stakeholders to define the agenda what is needed in in our uh, countries uh, where we are seeing the ncd burden rising so coming up with the evidence based approaches is can is something that can happen through involvement of different stakeholders and finally when we talk about implementation in, in relation to the ncds we are talking about the uh, interventions which are real world effective interventions life changing and life saving interventions and these are something which need to be uh, uh, implemented or applied in local contexts so this is uh, the same themes but need to be applied with slightly different emphasis when we talk about control of big four or even other ncds as we address we are really driven by our mission to empower people across stages of uh, their life Uh, uh, to uh, tackle diseases and uh, live longer so essentially our commitment anchors on three principles access partnerships and leadership our mission ncd really is a uh, much more holistic in terms of ncds we don't really focus on uh, the big four or the big five we focus on all the ncds including the skin conditions including uh, the immunological conditions mental health uh, and so on and so forth our uh, portfolio uh, with the depth and the breadth of our portfolio including biosimilars including primary care we are able to really provide access uh, to medicines and finally we are looking at partnerships evidence based partnerships which are with credible stakeholders passionate stakeholders and uh, which provide uh, local solutions which is the most important part of making a difference so finally i just want to end my brief uh, uh, conversation here with with a thought this crisis we can we have an opportunity to convert this crisis into a crisis of opportunity and the way to do that is really if we can leap frog we don't want to reinvent we don't want to rediscover what is already known we have the medicines and the technologies which are time tested which are uh, life saving and life changing so we need to integrate the learnings what the pandemic has shown into our road map and these uh, learnings are essentially around the three pillars as i have shown in the previous slide investing including and implementing so that is what i would really leave you with leaf rock by integrating the learnings what pandemic has shown i will pause here thank you very much thank you for the opportunity thank you very much dr shekar for your presentation and you raised very uh, critical uh, last word statements investment inclusion and you know those are the things that our government should have done yesterday and uh, from that background i think we we do have we, we need to understand that all diseases are interrelated and some cause others so covid has actually shown us that um, uh, that the ncds have been left out but we also realize that the the covid is actually targeting those with who are high risk and with a, a compromised immunity so it's important that governments invest for once and for all into the systems that are available uh, the health systems but also realize that during this pandemic communities have done a lot and the investment which i would implore our governments and ask to advocate for is to invest in caring uh, in, in the caring sector education health gender those are the key institutions that we need to look at as we speak and then communities so as long as we are not looking at the caring communities then we are not going to achieve or even to look at all the other diseases because a country countries have been independent for years why would we be caught off guard with covid-19 you would think that all the money is that governments are borrowing we are borrowing trillions of dollars in uganda on a daily but you don't see any improvement we are fighting for oxygen some god some local entrepreneurs are coming up with some uh, some local medication but governments have not been interested in looking up to resource the health centers uh, the, the health uh, ministry they are not looking at facilitating the communities to be able to link those who might need the support so with those few words i would like us to go into um Oh, oh uh, Flavia, yes. Flavia yes. we'll have to dispense with the questions because we will take all the questions and answer them via email. 
So I would like to thank all the participants here. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Potka. I think you really brought everything together in one. Again, uh, Lefty, thank you much for bringing that mental health uh, picture. And Chris, thank you for bringing that autoimmune diseases issue. Uh, we have got half an hour for all of our audience. Uh, please do take a break and now relax. I'm, I'm very sorry that we were skipping a break and then we don't want to skip your lunch, as you know. Many of you are um, patients and <laughs> you do require your sustenance and medication, etc. Uh, so thank you very much, everybody. And we'll join precisely at uh, 1400, that's two o'clock GMT again, and uh, resuffers. Do relax, have a walk, uh, take your medication, and uh, we'll join you then. Thank you very much, everybody.